Net. We really appreciate everyone being here this evening. And um, to uh, listen to Kay Carl Smith, we're excited about this, uh, the opportunity to talk about critical race theory in our schools happening now. Uh, whether it's denied or not, it's actually happening. Um, and I just want to introduce uh, John Clark to begin with. John. Thank you. thank you. I really want to thank Lisa. Uh, the people who have been volunteering have made such a difference. I think you can see. I try to work on the content, but what a nice event. It's so wonderful to see you all here. And I think you're going to agree when we leave that this is a really positive experience. Um, smiles everywhere. We had a great time last night, didn't we, Mr. Yeah. Smith? Yeah. So just to give you a little idea, some of you know, uh, I ran for governor. And I ran for governor because I really wanted to bring ideas to Vermonters that they were not hearing, that were being excluded from the conversation, including the issue of race. And 38 people stood up to run with me. Not all of them made it to the finish line, but some of them won. And we made a difference. And we made a difference because we talk about ideas instead of people. And the identity politics we're facing right now, including this racial issue, seems to do divide people into tribes instead of these ideas. And tonight we're here to talk about the ideas. So I'm very excited to tell you that it worked. We proved it worked. That if you bring people together around ideas, you can actually bridge some of these divisions. And so we're getting ready to do it again. Vermont Liberty Network is about keeping that movement going. It's not about me. Some think, oh, he's getting ready to run again. I don't know. But you are. So many people stood up and ran on the ideas. The progressive leader of the progressive party in Vermont lost, right, to Sally Aki, who I am glad to say never would have run had it not been for our craziness. All right? What's more important? And I know that Kay Carl Smith knows this. These are ideas that have endured for a long time, and they're important ideas. And that's why it's so exciting to talk about them. Now, in talking about critical race theory, I just want to sort of segue to Kay Carl, who really is here from Alabama. We're very excited to have you. Um, but that's a different world for you. Thank you. We're so excited to have you. Kay Carl and I actually hosted an event last year while I was on the campaign trail. COVID came, so we had to do it via Zoom call. So it's very nice to do it in person. And, um, but I want to explain a little bit about what's going on with critical race theory in Vermont because we can't expect you to know that, but to set it up so you can show us why the ideas of Frederick Douglass and the Constitution are the real solution to our racial division, not this new ideology, which is a coup effort on all levels against the Constitution. And that's what Vermonters need to understand. As I try to figure out how to explain this, I think people need to understand that it is the opposite of Martin Luther King and the ideas of Frederick Douglass. It is the opposite of the Constitution, and that's why many of us are having a hard time comprehending it. And one person asked a question last night after we spoke. They said, I posted this event on Facebook, and many people said they can't believe that segregation in Vermont schools is actually happening. Well, this is called cognitive dissonance. All right, I'm a lawyer. I bring facts in front of a court. The court right now is the parents of Vermont. Well, why don't you find out? Either it is or it isn't happening. And I'll assure you that it is because we've got the teaching materials where they're doing it up in Essex. And I read yesterday how they're doing it within our legislature. They've been doing it at press conferences where only black people are allowed to attend. The name of it under, under racial, racial equity is safe spaces. And it is designed around race, which itself is very difficult to identify in many times, especially as the centuries go by. The premise is that all white people are subconsciously racist and that neuroscience shows this. Therefore, every, every racial disparity in our country is attributed to a deep-seated hatred by white people of black people, and everything they suffer is due to the horrible malice of white people. That's a pretty big statement to make. You'd better be able to prove it. Let me tell you that they can't prove it. And so in our schools, Vermont is in a unique place for K. Carl. You get to return, though, to, to Alabama. <laughs> the whole nation is, is, is railing against this. Some 20 states' legislatures have been moving against this. We're told this is right-wing extremism. These are the ideas of Martin Luther King. Traditional Democrats should be with us. You admitted you used to be a Democrat. So was I. I was a different kind of Democrat. I supported the freedom of other people to have ideas. That's what supposedly Democrats believed in. Now we're the Republicans standing up for Martin Luther King's ideas, and we 
for being called racist for doing so. The problem is that the disparities that are in this country are not all attributable to systemic racism. Vermont, in particular, is not a systemic racist state. Okay? Everybody get that. And our governor and our legislature have been passing laws defining us as systemically racist and eliminating our history of abolitionism and even rewriting our history and manipulating statistics against our police and against good Vermonters. And it's all on the record. The evidence is before the court. Of course, they're segregating people because they believe that the only way to make a just society is to discriminate against white people to benefit black people. That only white people can be racist, black people cannot be racist. This is critical race theory. Look it up, it's so crazy, it's easy to dismiss it. It's in your schools. It's teaching children to hate themselves for their skin color. And Aaron Kinsvater has been a great gift, a UVM professor, no right wing extremist, who has been showing us in his discipline of cognitive behavioral therapy and in psychotherapy how harmful this is to compel people to say something that they don't necessarily believe. So we, are, we do know that critical race theory is here in Vermont. And it's either here to stay or parents will be rising up to make sure it doesn't. Do not discourage that they put this in and that they're waving Black Lives Matter flags everywhere. Because critical race theory is Black Lives Matter. It is a political ideology. It's not little letters that we care about black people. It's like, what if you put MAGA signs in every school in the state? You think they might complain? Because it's a violation of the First Amendment for government to embrace one party over the other, just in case nobody knew. Because in Vermont, we've been taken over by a progressive coup. And we talk about Marxism, and this is all rooted in Marxism, but let's show where else it's rooted. It's rooted in progressive academia, the same places where we got the eugenics movement, and the lobotomy science. Remember all the science? Let's jiggle a spike in somebody's brain. And if you dared speak up for those people, you were attacked. If you're a transgender person on whose victimhood this society is hinging so much right now and you change your mind, you are attacked. You are victimized. And if you're a black person, especially in Vermont, who dares to speak up against critical race theory, you're vilified. And I know this because we have a lot of black people who are not as brave as you, because you get to go home, like I said. <laughs> That's terrible. Their voices are valid. Watch the movie Uncle Tom, by the way, if you have not seen it. These are black voices. And more white Vermonters need to listen to black people instead of deciding they know what's best for them. Malcolm X had a lot to say about the liberals. But Malcolm X also embraced this Constitution. So I just want to show you a couple things in closing before I um, gladly introduce this wonderful speaker and I get to relax. So Vermont Liberty Network, we continue to highlight the um, bureaucratic ineptitude and bloat of our government. This is one of our shirts. I designed this myself. Farmers, we, we can make hay, we can, we can make t-shirts. This is the bloated dome with a tick in it being sprayed with a spray bottle. You're the spray bottle. Getting informed is how you ask them to be accountable for the money. Guess what happens next year when the price of gas and food keeps skyrocketing? We're going to see that they spent all of our efforts trying to brainwash our children instead of safeguarding their future. How dare you use your eugenics lobotomy, lobotomy untested science on these children. You have the duty to prove this is going to work. There is no evidence that critical race theory is going to work. None. How did we get here, Americans? How did we get here, Vermonters? Why would anybody trust any of their children into this school system next year, even if they pull it all back? This is a school choice issue. Okay, That's the revolution. Right now, when they tell you critical race theory is not being taught in schools, they are lying. Go find out for yourself. I've got materials. They don't want you to know. Why not? Gee, for five years, they've been telling us all this stuff. And now we try to talk about it. They say we want to deny a conversation about race. This is a book by Rajni Eddins, already in the materials in Essex. This guy moved here. I don't know what his education is. This is a book of hate. They're bringing this to the curriculum. You open this up, any page, it's about hate retribution forever. It talks, one, one whole poem is about hacking a white family to death with machetes till there's nothing left. After all, it's only fair, I quote. I can't even repeat the swears and obscenities and, and, and anti-Christian, anti-American, anti-flag, anti-everything, and this is in our school system already. Here's Thomas Sowell, Black Rednecks and White Liberals. Great book, I haven't finished it. This is, to me, the best way for all of us to arm ourselves against this. This is a black writer, Thomas Sowell, 
Harvard magna cum laude graduate, discrimination and disparities, an economist. Why isn't he being taught in school as a black voice who has the science and the statistics and doesn't abuse the math the way they are in our state? Why is this being taught? Because it's a coup. So before I, I looked just before I came, because I've been told not to talk about race. I looked it up. My first article in Vermont Digger Ever was in February of 2016, and it was called, Our Constitutions Have Never Been More Relevant. I didn't really think that was that prophetic. And the, head, the tagline was, if government could be trusted to observe and protect the rights of citizens, we would not need such documents or ideas. We are here to celebrate the Constitution. Literally celebrate. Listen to the positive message of your speaker tonight. I also wrote um, an article in November of 2016 called Reverse Racism. Doesn't exist, you know. Can't say it. And another in November of 16 called A Continuing Discussion of Race. I wrote another one called Black Supremacy in Vermont. Oh, horrid. What a title. Read it. I'm asking for equality. I'm asking to not have a new racial activation of children against one another. This is scary stuff, and whatever else you think of it, we're all going to have a voice at the table. And that's what Vermont Liberty Network is about. That's what this is the culmination for. All of you here have been involved in the conversation. I'm so excited to see more people joining it, to see wonderful people with their skill sets standing up for this important time for our nation. It's much more important than just the school issue. But Kay Carl Smith has come here from Alabama to talk about that in particular. He's a much better speaker than I, as you'll soon see, so I will be quiet. And so warmly and gratefully, welcome Kay Carl Smith from the Frederick Douglass Republican State of Vermont. Thank you. Let me clean house a little bit, John. Right. Sorry about that. You're, you're good. You're good. You're good. This is this is called Southern hospitality. Let me say that it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank you for coming. Thank you, John, for setting this up and inviting me back to your great state of Vermont. This this is the second time I've been here. Second time I've been here. I think the first time I was here about four years ago when I wrote my book, Frederick Douglass Republicans, and came in and spoke to uh, various groups. So it's a pleasure to be back. Let me um, uh, tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm a native of Pine Bluff, Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that all the way in Vermont. <laughs> Um, I have a, I, so I was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and my father is a math genius. Uh, my father, when he received his master's degree in mathematics from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, 1963-64, he was hired by NASA in Huntsville, Alabama, the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, where my father was hired and worked with the German scientist von Braun. Did the Saturn V boosters, all that kind of stuff. So I grew up in Huntsville. So we moved from Arkansas to Alabama in 1964. We moved from Arkansas to Alabama. You're not following me. We moved from Arkansas to Alabama to George Wallace country. And as a young boy growing up in Alabama, I had a chance to experience some things and witness some things as it pertained to race relations, racism, and all that kind of thing. I have uh, three brothers. All of us are five years apart. So you can see my father was indeed a mathematician. <laughs> he didn't want two boys in college at the same time. Um, my oldest brother is a retired uh, colonel of the United States Army. I'm also retired from the United States Army as a major. Well, I don't like using the word retirement. I completed my service obligation in 1996 before my first look for lieutenant colonel. Um, my brother that's five years my junior is a pastor of 30 some years. And my youngest brother, 10 years my junior, graduated from high school with a D minus. He is now a PhD physicist. <laughs> so remember, it's not how you start the race that counts, it's how you finish the race. So uh, that's, I always gotta tell this story because I'm really proud of him, what, he, what he's done with his life. Um, I grew up in a staunch Christian Democrat home. 
I was not converted to con conservatism. I've always been one. I just didn't know it. Because that's not the word we use. And I would, I would think, John, that most people here probably have a conservative leaning, you would say? Mm -hmm. There may be some exceptions here. If there are, let me give you this warning now. By the time I finish here, you're probably going to change your affiliation. Because <laughs> you may have an awakening like I had. Um, I am going to talk about the critical race theory in the second part of my speech here. But the first thing I want to talk about, my thing is messaging. I contend that if we're going to save our nation, defeat the critical race theory, it's all about messaging. It's all about us being able to have a, a conversation with our friends, our family members, and people who may not look like us about the importance of liberty, the importance of the Constitution, and dismantle this whole Marxist agenda to destroy America from the inside. That's what's really going on. Indeed, it is a spiritual battle, but it's about Marxism. And, and John talked about it, he mentioned it right. This whole CRT, BLM, when you, go to, when you go to the BLM website, they proclaim that they're trained Marxists. So this is not, this is not a surprise. And they want to destroy America from the inside. So in order to do that, we got to become better advocates of liberty. We got to know how to trump the race card, pun intended. And you got to understand that as a conservative now, that before we get a chance to speak, we have already been discredited. That's our problem. You know, the, the word conservative has a racist connotation. I don't know if you, if you know that. If you, could, if you describe yourself as a black conservative, a constitutional conservative, Reagan conservative, that's what you're saying, but that's not what people are hearing. What people are hearing is black conservative, black racist. Reagan conservative, Reagan racist. If you say you're a Tea Party conservative or a constitutional conservative, now you are a racist racist. <laughs> and you're on the defense. And if we're going to save this nation, we got to be on the offense all the time. You follow me? So that's what's happening. We have to win this narrative. We have to be in the trenches and engage people. We got to have a conversation with them, not a confrontation. We got to get people to listen to us. Right now, nobody's listening to us. Well, think about it. If I perceive somebody to be a racist, I don't care what they say. I don't care what truth you speak, what evidence you bring, what statistics you show. I'm not going to listen to someone I perceive as a racist or an Uncle Tom. That's what we're dealing with. You follow me? And uh, I've been speaking across the country for the past 12 years and this whole thing about as I travel the country, I intentionally, I go out and I preach to the choir. I preach to the conservative choir to teach the choir how to go out and bring in new choir members and give the choir member a new song to sing. I'm okay with hymns, but hymns don't work all the time. You got, you got to sing, you got to come with a different message, especially that overcomes the negative propaganda of the left. Now, I'm going to play an audio for you. I'm not going to tell you who this is, but you're going to recognize the voice. This is somebody over the years we have come to love and respect. And I'm going to hope I can play this right. Let me get the volume up. Listen carefully what this talk show host has to say. I can find it. I feel your pain. Good gosh. <laughs> Take your there, time. there it is. There it is. Take your time. I, look, I, I don't like having to say this, but uh, being honest with you and with myself is, is paramount. And I can tell you, and you know this without me telling you, that if, if conservatism and liberalism are brands, the left has succeeded in destroying the, destroying the brand of conservative. All you have to say the word conservative and they think you're talking about a Nazi or a racist. Right. Pushing conservatism is not the answer. So what I would suggest to you, 
when you're out and about and you're doing, if you if you run a, a, into an, a, an occasion where you have the opportunity to talk politics, people that don't agree with you, do not use the word conservative. Do everything else, but don't call yourself that. Don't promote it. We've got a brand problem. It's time we, I, I hate it. I hate having to admit it. Get rid of it. Stop calling yourself that. Just be one. Just talk to people as one. You know what I think? I think you're going to find, if we do this, that you're going to have far more people agree with your solutions than will disagree if you don't identify yourself first as a conservative when talking. Nobody needs to abandon conservatism. It's just stop labeling everything we think or do as conservative and just do it. You recognize that voice? The Godfather? <laughs> Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh made that comment back in 2018, I think it was November 28, 2018, during the third hour of his show. I've been saying that for the past 12 years. So Rush agrees with me. <laughs> so here's the question. Now listen to what Rush had to say. He said, don't stop being a conservative now. Don't throw away your values. But understand using that word is the problem because the left has demonized it. So the question is, how should we identify ourselves? I'm glad you asked. Several years ago, I was invited to a friend's home to watch our favorite football team play on television. There were 18 to 20 blacks in attendance. All of them were black Democrats. When I, when I, um, and during that night, excuse me, the subject, the subject of politics surfaced. When I shared with my friends that I was a conservative Republican, the attacks began. They called me everything but a child of God that night. Uncle Tom, foot shuffler, house nigga. Your parents must be disappointed in you. How could you do such a thing? When I said I was a conservative, to them I just grew seven heads. And the attack was on. Their insults ran the gamut. And I'm on the defense the whole night. I left that event thinking and mostly praying about how can I best articulate my values, my conservative values, how can I win the narrative and win them and inspire them to vote their values. See, many of them were more conservative than I am. So after several weeks and months and a year of reading and research, I invented something called the Frederick the Frederick Douglass Republican Engagement Strategy. So a year later, I invited those same 18 to 20 black Democrat friends of mine to my home to watch our favorite football team play on television. Reluctantly, they all came. And of course that night, the subject of politics surfaced. They said, okay, Carl, he's a conservative Republican. I said, wait a minute. I'm more than a conservative. I'm more than a Republican. I am a Frederick Douglass Republican, and I believe in the life empowering values of Frederick Douglass. Respect for the U.S. Constitution, respect for life. I believe in the limited power of government, economic prosperity, free speech, school choice, women's rights, the right to keep and bear arms, religious liberty. When I shared that with them, all of them start talking about how they were a Frederick Douglass Republican too. It worked. For the first time in my life, I had the confidence, the knowledge, and the skill to trump the race car, pun intended. Tonight, before you leave here, you're going to know how to do the same. You're going to know how to have a healthy atmosphere for political discourse without the fear of being called a racist. Until you're able to do that, you will be on the defense, proving that you're not a racist. Well, I'm gonna teach you how to overcome that. John was right. I remember those, those, those life empowering values, I just, the life, the life empowering values I just went through, respect for the Constitution, respect for life. 
We call those life empowering values in lieu of saying conservative values. You follow me? Here's what John just took out of my notes. He didn't, and he doesn't know it. Values, re, values unite. Issues divide. When you focus on those life empowering values that Douglas wrote about, that's how you find common ground with people, regardless of their, their political label. That's what happened to me that night. When I shared with them what my values were, respect for the Constitution, respect for life, belief in limited power of government, economic prosperity, free speech, school choice, it resonated with them. And race came off the table. Uncle Tom came off the table by leveraging Frederick Douglass. See, Frederick Douglass wrote about each of those values that I just laid out to you. You remember Frederick Douglass, don't you? Born 1818 in the Eastern Shores area of Maryland. The way I like to put it, Frederick Douglass was born below poverty. See, when you're born into slavery, you're born below poverty. Never step, uh, never, uh, step in the bed to age eight, never owned a pair of shoes to age 10. He was homeschooled, self-taught. Frederick Douglass started his own homeschooling program to learn how to read and write. And you want to know why? Because he rejected the slave master's common core curriculum. Did y'all get that? Yeah. Dad, God, I got to work on that punchline some more. <laughs> and so, so Douglass was a slave for the first 20 years of his, of his life. Never had any formal education, none, all homeschooled. All homeschooled. Let me share some tidbits about Douglas's life. Frederick Douglass um, wrote three autobiographies, and he wrote a novel called The Heroic Slave. And the reason I'm, make the, I'm making this point because, based on my reading of history, at that time, 90% of blacks could not read or write. That brother wrote three books, three autobiographies, and a, and a, and a novel. Frederick Douglass was an advisor to five Republican presidents, five of them. Ulysses S. I mean, Abraham Lincoln's first, Ulysses S. Grant, James Garfield, Rutherford Hayes, and Benjamin Harrison. Most folks don't get a chance to meet one president. This brother was an advisor to five Republican presidents. Frederick Douglass passed away in 1895. At the age of 77, he died of a massive heart attack. When Frederick Douglass passed away, that brother had $300,000 in savings back then. When you calculate the inflation, that's over $10 million today. So you see that the life of Frederick Douglass is inspiring. He started his life as a sub-zero percenter. He was on a plantation getting that free stuff. I can make the case Douglas was a 47 percenter. He died a 1 percenter. I like leveraging the life of Frederick Douglass when I talk to young people about success because no matter which victim category that the left try to put people in, no American today can out-victimize Frederick Douglass. Your excuses go away. Now, that's the life of Douglas. I want to shift now and talk about the writings of Frederick Douglass. In my view, Frederick Douglass is America's greatest liberty messenger, the greatest philosopher on human rights and liberty. Frederick Douglass. The Founding Fathers gave us two magnificent documents, the, Declar the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But what Frederick Douglass had to say about freedom and liberty is more important than what any of the founders had to say. That's heresy, K. Carl. That's blasphemy. <laughs> Let me prove my point. Of course, the founders gave us those two magnificent documents. If you recall now, some of the founders owned slaves. And the slaves were not free when the Constitution was ratified. In many cases, the slaves were free after the death of the founder. So when it comes to liberty, the founders are tainted, and the left exploits that. These racist men who owned slaves gave us this racist document called the Constitution, don't they? 
Thank God that we have the literary legacy of Frederick Douglass to refute the lies and the false rhetoric of the left. Douglass wrote on the Constitution one day, Douglass said, the Constitution reads, we the people. It does not read, we the white people, end of quote. Douglass went on to say, if black folks are considered to be people, then they should be benefactors of the Constitution. He concluded by saying, the problem is not with the Constitution. The problem is in the application of the Constitution. The problem is not with the Bible. The problem is in how the Bible is applied. So again, thank God we have the literary legacy of Frederick Douglass. These, these life-empowering values, Douglass wrote about immigration. He wrote about school choice. He wrote about um, free speech. Douglass in Boston, he gave a, a speech called The Plea for Free Speech in Boston. And one of the most powerful statements in that speech, Douglass said this. He said, tyrants cannot tolerate free speech because they know the power of it. See, if I have free speech, I can let the world know what you're doing to me. Without free speech, I'm stuck like Chuck. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. This whole, this whole liberty messenger engagement strategy is based on the liberty message of Frederick Douglass. I also contend that Frederick Douglass is not only America's greatest liberty messenger, but he is the forgotten prophet. He was a philosopher. And he, of course, he wrote those books, but you can go to Yale University Press. They have a collection of Douglass's writing called the Douglass Papers, four volumes, six size font, I mean, thousands of pages. Uh, you can go to Amazon and get Philip, Philip Fawner's writings, uh, selective writings of Douglass that's different for in the uh, Douglas Papers, 900 page book, six size font. I read all that. I became obsessed with Douglas. I became so obsessed with Douglas. I thought I was Frederick Douglas. <laughs> I wrote all, I read everything that he wrote, every speech he gave. I, if I could get my hand on it, I read it. Every biography that was written on Douglas at that time, I read it. I went on a reading binge because he turned my thinking right side up. I'm a graduate of Historical Black College, Alabama A&M University. I was taught in college that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. I was taught in college that blacks were considered three-fifths of a human being, meaning that remember the Constitution had the three-fifths clause? And, um, and I was taught in college, and this is still being taught today, by the way. I talked to some BLM kids not recently, and they came up with this three-fifths clause mean that blacks are three-fifths of a human being. It was Frederick Douglass that changed my thinking. And when I share what Frederick Douglass said to those BLM uh, kids, young people, it changed their thinking. It was March 26, 1861, Frederick Douglass in Glasgow, Scotland. He was actually in a debate. And this whole thing about the Constitution came up. So what Douglass said, the three-fifth clause has nothing to do with the personhood of a black individual but it was a compromise approach used by the northern free states above the southern slave states. See, at that time, in the Constitution, it read that for every 30,000 citizens, you get one congressional representation. So the slave states want to count every black person in slavery, which is like four million of them, as one person, one vote, which would give them a huge majority in Congress. The free states said, nope, if you free them, we'll let you count them as one person, one vote, but since you can't free them, we'll let you count the slave population as three-fifths of a vote. So a free person, a black person in the free state is worth five-fifths of a vote. A black person in the slave state, because they're still in bondage, is only three-fifths of a vote. When I shared that with them, their eyes got big. When you're engaging people who are of a left-wing persuasion, here's what I've learned. They get indoctrinated in college but they never heard the liberty message coming from Frederick Douglass. They never heard it. And how can you argue with a runaway slave about his love for the Constitution, his admiration for the founding fathers? Do you follow me? It would behoove us to get into the writings of Frederick Douglass and make that part of our language as we engage. Leverage what Frederick Douglass had to say about these life-empowering values. So, 
The power of this whole Frederick Douglass Republican engagement strategy is that it's, this is not a gimmick. This is not a technique or uh, persuasive messaging model on how to talk to black people. It's a messaging model on how to engage anyone regarding your conservative values. And you do it in a way where you're on the offense, not on the defense, and where race comes off the table. So what is the political identity we should go by now? We're not going to use the word conservative. The political identity is, I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. See, a Frederick Douglass Republican, that's, you're not a Frederick Douglass Republican because of your skin color. You are Frederick Douglass Republican because of the values. What are those values? Respect for the Constitution, respect for life, the belief in the limited power of government, economic prosperity, free speech, school choice, women's rights, legal, legal immigration, religious liberty, the right to keep and bear arms. Frederick Douglass wrote about all of these things. That's why you gotta leverage him. I'm here to tell you, if we can grow a nationwide movement of people like yourselves who know how to leverage the liberty message of Frederick Douglass and make that part of your own, the left now, where are they gonna go? They gotta go back to France. <laughs> Jump out of 12-story buildings. The left have no answer for Frederick Douglass and they never will. They never will. So thank God we have this literary legacy we can leverage on. If we didn't have Frederick Douglass, I don't know where we'll be. Because the, the left can play the race card on everybody else. You can't play the race card on Douglass. Douglass was not a racist, he was the victim of racism. But he left with this, lit this literary legacy that we can use today if we, if we are wise enough to leverage it. So it's an engagement strategy. Let me quickly talk about how, why it's so powerful. So it's not a gimmick. This is not some cheap magician's trick that I've come up with. This is a divinely inspired message that God gave to me 12 years ago. And I've been for the past 12 years traveling around the country preaching to the choir to empower you, making myself scalable, how to talk to your friends, how to talk to your family members. You know what I'm talking about. You got family, they come around your house around Thanksgiving time. You get so upset, you leave and go to the tiny table with the little kids. How do you engage them? You engage them by leveraging the liberty message of Frederick Douglass and letting them know that your political identity is, is a Frederick Douglass Republican. See, that Frederick Douglass Republican, reason why it's such a powerful phrase, it is because simply this, it's an oxymoron for a lot of folks. Frederick Douglass is an icon of liberty. Republican, because of negative propaganda of the left, is an icon of racism. Liberty, racism, they just don't go together. So when you utter the phrase, I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican, you just created a mystery in the other person's mind and they want to know what you're talking about. That's when now you got to have some content to go with the phrase. You just can't utter the phrase. You got to have the content to go behind it. You follow me? You don't have to write any of this down. I wrote a book, I'm going to share it with you tonight where I lay all this stuff out. Okay? Let's uh, shift now and get into this whole critical race theory. We're not going to be long. The critical race theory. When you read, and I sat down, I read it. I read it for myself. And the conclusion I have drawn is this. All it is, it is a Marxist agenda, anti-liberty, anti-God, to destroy the United States from the inside based on stirring up uh, racial strife. That's all it is. Where does this come from? This is nothing new. Where does this come from? Here's a book you need to get your hands on. This book is written by Manning Johnson. It's called Color, Communism, and Common Sense. Manning Johnson is a black American. Manny Johnson wrote this book. This book came out in 1958. Manny Johnson reached the 
upper level of the American Communist Party. He was so liked by the Communists because he was so articulate, they actually sent him to Moscow for training. So when Man and, and Manny became a communist because he was disillusioned with capitalism. And he thought that communism would be the friend to black folks and create this utopia. As he got into more of the communists and the teachings and their, their strategies, he realized that's not the case. So he wrote this book, a, all, a tell-all book. It's like 76 pages. Then sometime later, Manning died in a, in a very, in, died in a car accident. And they said that there's no proof that it showed any type of foul play, but they, they play, you know, <laughs> the Marxists play for keeps. So in this book, in this book, which you need to get your hands on, Manning talks about the whole strategy of Marxism and communism is to create racial strife. They want us to ignore all the gains we have made over the years in terms of race relations, as if we have made any gains. They have to keep that alive. See, what Marxism is, when, uh, when Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, his philosophy, his idea was, look, we got to create this revolution based on class. He put the have lots against the have nots to create this conflict. So back in like 1928, when the communists came over to America and tried to bring that here, it, done, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because in the United States, you can be poor one day, come up with an idea, or take your God giving gift, you can become a one percenter, like a Frederick Douglass. So that classism stuff doesn't work here. So the communists said, we got to find something else, how we can create strife. They decided to focus on race. Why? Because color doesn't change. It doesn't change. Manny Johnson talks about that. Get that book, Manny Johnson, Color, Common Sense, and Color Coming is the Common Sense. I want to read for you um, excerpts of the 45 goals of the American Communist Party. I want to read them to you. I'm not going to read all of them to you now, not all 45, because um, as I read them, some of them are going to come, it's going to hit home because they have accomplished a lot of these. This was um, In 1963, there was a congressman out of Florida. He went to the House, floor of the House, and he read into the congressional record the 45 goals of communism. Okay? His name was, uh, what was his name? Albert S. Herlong, congressman out of Florida. This is 1963 when he did this. Let's see if any of these goals hit home. Number 15, capture one or both of the political parties in the United States. Check. If John F. Kennedy was alive today, he would not get elected in the Democrat Party. 17, get control of the schools. Use them as a transmission belt for socialism and current communist propaganda. Check. Number 21, gain control of key positions in, in radio, TV, and motion pictures. Check. Why do you think there's never been a movie about Frederick Douglass? James Brown got a movie. Aretha Franklin got a movie. Tupac has a movie. There's never been a movie, a movie about Frederick Douglass coming out of Hollywood. Why? Because the views and the writings of Frederick Douglass is the opposite of is a socialist. Totally opposite. Number 22, continue discrediting uh, American culture by degrading all forms of artistic expression. A company sale was told to eliminate all good sculpture from parks and buildings. This is 1963. Check. You know, during the, in one of the riots last year in Rochester, New York, they actually tore down Frederick Douglass' statue. Y'all remember that? 
people are idiots. Number, se- uh, number 26. Present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. Check. 27, infiltrate the churches and replace, reveal religion with social religion. Check. Here's the last one I'm going to read to you. Well, I'm going to read two more to you. It says here, discredit the American Constitution by calling it inadequate, old-fashioned, and out of step with modern needs. Check. And one more. Create the impression that violence and insurrection are legitimate aspects of the American tradition. That students and special interest groups should rise up and make a united force to solve economic, political, and social pro- problems. That's what we saw going in the streets. How do we win this? You win it by messaging, by leveraging Frederick Douglass. The most effective liberty message to counter Marxism is Frederick Douglassism. I'm in the airport, I had on my Trump cap. I was flying to DC and there were some BLM kids right in front of me that we're at the gate. And here's this black guy got a Trump cap on. They didn't say anything to me. I just said, do you like my cap? <laughs> Then a conversation started. Then, uh, when I, then I told them about my political identity. I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. It was like a deer in headlights. They stopped. And they don't know what I'm talking about. It gives me a chance to seize control of the narrative. And I started talking about what I believe in. Again, what I learned is they never heard the liberty message coming from the writings of Frederick Douglass, a former slave. Never heard it. Never heard it. Everything they talked about, Douglas wrote about. They talked about the Constitution. I told them what Douglas said about the Constitution. They talked about right to keep and bear arms. I told them what Douglas said about right to keep and bear arms. School choice. I told them what Douglas said about school choice. I gave them one of my engagement cards that I'm going to talk about in a minute. They were enlightened. I didn't have a confrontation. It was a conversation. And I was driving the bus. Why? By leveraging Frederick Douglass. What I want you to get out of this that I'm saying to you t- tonight, this engagement strategy works. And it works more effectively when a white person uses the strategy and leverages Douglass. It's more effective when you use it than when I use it. Because why? Frederick Douglass, that's my ethnicity. I expect, you know, people expect me to hold Frederick Douglass in high esteem. But all we hear on CNN, MSNBC, that white conservatives, white liberty advocates are racist. But when you come out and say from your heart, I hold Frederick Douglass in high esteem and I agree with his life and power and values, respect for the Constitution, respect for life. I believe in the limited power of government, economic prosperity, free speech, good choice. When you say that, as someone who they don't expect to say that, you just took a major step to win the narrative. Now you're, you're in the driver's seat in the conversation and race comes off the table. A racist cannot and will not say that they hold Frederick Douglass in high esteem. Will not. Do you follow me? It works. So what God gave me, so I took the liberty message of Frederick Douglass and I combined it with the diversity outreach strategy of the Apostle Paul. Now I'm not here to push my religion now. But I'm here to share with you that in the, in the Bible, which is a how-to book, there are some things in there that we need to look at to learn and glean from in terms of best practices. Because in that book, when you think about it, the Apostle Paul, he was a diversity engagement strategist. You remember Paul? He was called by God, commissioned by God to take the gospel to the Gentiles, people of different what? Ethnicities, different races. Right? You know, and by occupation, the Apostle Paul, he what? He was an attorney, and he was a tent maker. Am I right? 
I'm not making this stuff up. I tell my son all the time, I got a 10-year-old son. I said, son, don't believe anything I tell you. I'm not going to lie to you now. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, but don't believe anything I tell you. You go back and check it out. Don't give me no excuse you can't check it out. Just go ask Siri and ask Alexa. They'll tell you. <laughs> so don't believe anything I tell you. Don't believe anything I tell you. Prove me wrong. So God called the Apostle Paul to take the gospel of the Gentiles. Paul was an attorney, and he was a tent maker. God called the Apostle to establish a big tent. Big tent. That's a metaphoric expression we use all the time as conservatives. We've got to have a what? A big tent. Hmm. Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 9, 22, the Apostle Paul says something like, I become all things to all people. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that, he's, when you read some of the other translations, the Apostle Paul was saying, I entered their world, talking about, the, talking about the, uh, excuse me, the Gentiles, and I tried to experience life from their viewpoint. If you enter my world and you try to experience life from my viewpoint, or you enter the world of young people today and you try to experience life from their viewpoint based on the indoctrination they're getting, you're going to quickly learn the word conservative is not the language of liberty. It's the language of oppression. Okay? If I need to talk about that a little bit more and give you a history on that, I'll share that with you. So what we did, we took the liberty message of Frederick Douglass, the diversity outreach strategy of Paul Paul, we put them together. Unstoppable. Unstoppable. Also, in the ministry of the Apostle Paul, I'm not going to have anybody else say this because God didn't give it to them. God gave it to me. I'm sharing it with you. Through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, God has given the answer how to trump the race card. Think about it. Through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, we have the blueprint on how to trump the race card. You remember Paul now, before he became a champion of Christianity, he was also well known for being a bloodthirsty persecutor of Christians. Am I right? And that reputation preceded him. The Gentiles shook with fear when they heard Paul's name. And Paul had his Damascus Road experience, right? Allow me to use my biblical imagination for one moment. Just imagine what was some of the talk among the Gentiles about Paul. Can you imagine them sitting? You know how people are. You can imagine them sitting back and saying, y'all, y'all look at Paul. That no good liar, he's over there calling himself a Christian evangelist. He's a bigot. He's a racist. Ain't those words sound familiar? That's what they say about conservatives, right? He's, he's, trying, to, he's trying to fool us. Y'all know what he did to those people in Jerusalem and Judea? Y'all heard about that? He's coming over here saying he's a Christian evangelist, want us to become Christians so he can kill us too. Here's the question. There's no denying that the Apostle Paul had a tremendous impact in the early growth of the church. So the question becomes, in order to have that impact, how did he overcome the negative perception that the Gentiles had of him? How did he trump the race card? He did two things. Number one, at a minimum, he did two things. Number one, he had a testimony. When you read Paul's writings, he didn't just uh, talk about uh, Christ, but he talked about how the teachings of Christ, well, let me take it back. He didn't just quote the Christ, but he talked about how the teachings of Christ changed his thinking, changed his mind, made him a new person. He was transformed. If we're going to trump the race car, we got to have a similar testimony. I call it a political inspiration, an old declaration. What is that inspirational statement, Kay Carl? I've been inspired by the life and writings of Frederick Douglass. I'm more than a conservative. I'm more than a Republican. I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. And I believe the life and part of the values of Douglass. Respect for the Constitution, respect for life, da, da, da. Okay? Then, the other Paul, Paul had good deeds, excuse me. He had good deeds. He traveled throughout the Roman Empire. He traveled throughout Asia Minor. He went to places nobody else had ever been before. He was menacing the people that he's supposed to be what? Racist towards, right? When you put those two together, when you put good deeds and your testimony together, that's unstoppable. You can't have one without the other. 
You can't have one without the other. For the last two years, I've been uh, an advisor to the Trump campaign for Black Voices for Trump. And I shared with them, I said, look, here's a challenge. The president has a lot of good deeds in terms of legislation that was passed that impacted the black community in a positive way. Criminal justice reform, opportunity zone, uh, unemployment at all time low in the black community. Um, what's another one? Yeah, and funding black colleges and make that funding permanent for 10 years. All that's what? Good deeds. I said, I said, here's the thing. With all those good deeds in January, I think, about two years ago, oh, uh, a poll came out. With all those good deeds, 80% of blacks still felt that he was a racist. With all those good deeds, I said, something is missing. You got to have a testimony. As a surrogate, it's not what I say about him that matters, what he says about himself. See, and I told them, I said, you got to understand through which biblical lens that many blacks, and I'm talking about myself here, I was a staunch Democrat, and the, when I voted Democrat, the, you got to understand through which biblical lens was I viewing the world. And a lot of them are doing, them doing it today. And the way we view the world was through Proverbs 21 and 1 that the heart of the king is in the hands of God. That God can take a quote unquote racist president and use him to bless me. Criminal justice reform, opportunity zones, unemployment all time low, funded historical black colleges. So President Trump is not gonna get the credit and he didn't get the credit. God got the credit because God made the racists do it. That's why we got Trump this race card first. Well, we, well, a lot of people don't realize there's two battles taking place. It's the battle of propaganda and the battle of ideas. We have the best ideas. We're stuck in the propaganda piece. We're using the wrong name to identify ourselves that's been demonized. We got to win that battle. And once we win that battle, we can bring in statistics. We can bring in truth. See, the first thing when it comes to engaging, if you're going to solve the CRT problem, when you engage your friends, it's not to talk the facts, truth, evidence about CRT. The first thing you got to do, because we're conservatives, we've been demonized, right? The first thing you must do is learn how to create trust and credibility for yourself in order to get people to listen. How do you do that? I've been inspired by the life and writings of Frederick Douglass. I'm more than a conservative Republican. I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. That has to become part of your pattern. Okay, you follow me? Make sense to you? Karl Marx, Frederick Douglass. When I did my research on this whole critical race theory, it's so, it's so Marxist agenda, it comes out of writing of Karl Marx, right? Here's some things about Karl Marx and Frederick Douglass that are gonna make, get your attention. Frederick Douglass and Karl Marx were both born in 1818. They were both born in 1818. Of course, Frederick Douglass was born into, into, pop, into slavery. When you go back and read Karl Marx, Karl Marx is a poster child for white privilege. <laughs> Karl Marx is a poster child for white privilege. And I, when I said that to those BLM kids, I said, uh, I, said, I said, you despise white privilege, don't you? He said, yeah. But the man you following, his philosophy, he was a white privilege. His father was a lawyer. But when it comes to a person who was oppressed and talk about the nature of oppression, Frederick Douglass, you don't listen to that. And you brag about that you're a trained Marxist. And you believe in Marxism. I said, I believe in Frederick Douglassism. When I shared it with them, they got it. This, what I'm talking about, engaging, leveraging Frederick Douglass, is a transferable skill. You can do it. I'm giving you the strategy. I can't give you the wheel. If you're serious about defending liberty, defending the Constitution, defeating Marxism once and for all, you got to leverage Frederick Douglass. If not, it's over with. Stop waiting for the Calvary to come. Stop looking outside of yourself for the Calvary. You're the Calvary. <laughs> don't, don't go out looking for a leader. Pick yourself to be a leader. That's what we need now. <laughs> Look. I had to pick myself. I've been asked to run for Congress in Alabama. Well, they picked me. But 
um, I got to think about that thing because I'm not a politician. I'm a problem solver, but I'm not a politician. So that may be something I may have to do. But uh, yeah, I asked. Practice what you preach. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, I'm not going to wait for somebody. I, I, God put in my heart to do it. I'm, I'm almost there. But um, we got to solve this problem. I'm pretty sure I can win. See, what's needed now, we don't need politicians who count their campaign about they're going to balance the budget and con control spending. All that means nothing. You can't defeat Marxism. And we need the candidates now who have a unifying message. A candidate who can get out there and get people who traditionally don't vote Republican to vote Republican. How you do that? You leverage Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. I've been into the lion's den with Frederick Douglass and come out unscathed. NWCP meetings, black churches. Let me tell you the barbershop story, then we we'll get to your questions. When God had perfected this message in me, this Frederick Douglass piece, the first person I tried it on was my brother, five years my junior. PhD, pastor, some 25 years. He said, I, I said, I said, what do you know about Frederick Douglass? He said, not much. He said, Dad, you know Douglass was Republican, right? He said, Douglass was Republican? I said, yeah, read this. Read Douglass' autobiography. Read the, read the, the Federalist Papers. Read the Constitution. So I sent him through like six months of training. After six months of training, uh, I said to my brother, put this t-shirt on and I want you to come to Atlanta with me. We produce a t-shirt that has three big bold letters on it. F-D-R, it's not who you think, Frederick Doug's Republican. <laughs> so I told her brother, come on, go to Atlanta with me. So he had no idea what I was doing. So he, we drove to Atlanta and I pulled up in front of a barber shop. I said, get out the car, go inside the barber shop with the t-shirt, I'll be back in two hours. He said, what? I said, get out the car, go inside the barber shop, and uh, see what happens. I'll be back in two hours to pick you up. So he gets out the car, and two hours later, I came back and picked him up. He gets in the car. I said, how did it go? He said, man, this thing works. I said, what happened? He said, he went inside the barber shop. There was about 12 or 13 black guys in the barber shop. And he had this FDR shirt on, had the word Republican on it. Two guys, after five minutes of him sitting down, two guys said to him in unison, are you a Republican? <laughs> he said, I'm a friend of Douglas Republican. I believe the life and power of that is a friend of Douglas. Respect for the Constitution, respect for life. I believe a limited power of government, economic prosperity, free speech, school choice. He said, for the next 49 minutes, the barbershop turned into a friend of Douglas Republican Bible study. <laughs> because they were curious about that oxymoron. As a result, the proprietor of the barbershop said, hey, can you come back and do a book signing out of the barbershop? Now, we're in the hood now. And bring some of those books with you. Some of those books. So what happened several years ago, so my brother and I, we wrote this book back in 2011. The book's entitled, it's probably got plastic on it, you can't see it. Uh, it's called Frederick Douglass Republicans, The Movement to Reignite America's Passion for Liberty. Not black folks' passion for liberty, everybody's passion for liberty, based on the writings of this ex-slave. So the book, it's not, a, it's not a dissertation on the political thoughts of Douglas, but what it is, it's a liberty messenger's handbook. In this book, I take four life empowering values, and I give you five quotes what Frederick Douglass said about each one of them. Respect for the Constitution, respect for life, the belief in limited government, and the belief in uh, personal responsibility, what Doug said, what Doug said, about, said about each one of them. Five quotes. Let me go back here. In the book, the third value is that I believe in limited government. I don't say that anymore. Because when you say I believe in limited government, what the left will do, oh, you believe in limited government, you want to take folks' entitlements away. Now I say I believe in the limited power of government, government, where I like to keep more of the money that I make. It resonates. So um, I have some books here. With the book comes what I call, there's five engagement cards with the book. And it says on it, vote your values. Remember now, values unite. Ideas unite. 
So, so it's uh, on this card are six life empowering values, and a quote from Frederick Douglass regarding each one of them. What did Douglass say about uh, immigration, the right to keep and bear arms, school choice, economic prosperity, women's rights, religious liberty? It's a quote from Frederick Douglass and, and the Constitution. It's a quote from Frederick Douglass regarding each one of them. That's the engagement card. See, once you read the book and you know how to engage, the engagement card is what you pass out to people and get them to have an awakening. And they read what Frederick Douglass has to say. They get it. How are you going to argue with a runaway slave? Also comes with the book is Frederick Douglass Republican on critical race theory. I, I, I thought about this thing. I said, what is the best way to dismantle this critical race theory? Because they talk about racism, right? The best way to dismantle it is to go back and take a look at the United States when racism was at its worst. That was in Douglass' time. See, we've come a long way. The racism that does exist in the United States today is pale in comparison to the racism in Douglass' time. We've come a long way. They don't want us to think that. They always want to keep strife, right? So I say, OK, what did Douglass have to say about there, there, there are several assertions made in this critical race theory, and John talked about them. One of the assertions that's being made in the critical race theory, number one, that blacks are perpetual victims of white racism. That's in the critical race theory. Well, what did Douglas have to say about that? He said something about it. This was um, 1862, Doug was in Boston speaking to a group of abolitionists. And what he said to them, he said, stop treating black people like we're a special class of citizen. He said, y'all didn't do anything special for the Irish. <laughs> he said, leave black folks alone. So he said, so, so the question was for Frederick Douglass at that time, they asked Douglass this question, what shall we do with the Negro? Because when the with the Emancipation Proclamation being signed, four million black folks are going to be free from slavery, right? Technically free. So they asked Douglas, what shall we do with the Negro? Douglas said, what do you mean, what shall you do with the Negro? Don't you think you've done enough? You made him a slave. <laughs> he said, stop playing mischief with black folks' lives. Douglas said, quote, leave him alone and mind your own business because your interference is causing him positive injury. Quit coming up with these social programs and treating black folks like we're some type of social guinea pig with these theories that don't work. Douglas wrote about that. When you turn to the second part, this is something that God gave me, I'm going to share it with you. It's on the part, it's at the top part of the, uh, of the card. And I cannot read this because I got this plastic wrapped around it. Here's what I'm saying here. I wrote this, convinced that blacks cannot provide for themselves, needing, master, needing a master, um, needing masters to rule and feed them. The left think their instruction and their benevolence is better to improve the, out, the condition of black folks than giving them liberty. Don't give them liberty. Let us take care of them. That's the slave master mentality. Douglas wrote about that. The slave master mentality was blacks can't handle liberty. So we got to make them our slave and take care of them. Give them instruction. Give them benevolence. Wicked benevolence, by the way. They can't handle liberty. That's what critical race theory is all about. They got to come up with social programs. Since we're victims now, that means I'm an I'm a internal victim. No, I'm more than a conqueror. The other thing is critical race theory that whites are inherently racist and have no redemptive qualities. Now, here's what bothered me. If they're making that assertion, well, how do white liberals get a pass? <laughs> how do they get a pass? They're excluding themselves from, from this. So, if whites are inherently racist and have no redemptive qualities, what did Frederick Douglass have to say about that? When Frederick Douglass escaped from slavery, 10 years after he escaped from slavery, he wrote a letter 
to his former slave master. And he said in that letter when you read it, I forgive you for all things you did to me. I'm not going to, you can come see me, you can visit me anytime. I'm not going to make you eat outside like you made me eat outside. Doug said, I'm going to use you as an example how men ought to treat each other. And in that letter, Doug said, oh, by the way, I want you to free all 400 of your slaves. All 400 of them. And until you do, I'm going to write about you in my book. I'm going to talk about you in my speeches. I'm going to call you out on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> So Douglas was the original blogger. <laughs> Within a year, less than a year, less than a year of Douglas making that, insisting that his master do that, within a year, his slave master freed all 400 of his slaves. Why? He redeemed. He was redeemed. And Douglas used that word redemptive um, in, his, in his quote. You'll see it on the card. That slave master freed all 400 of his slaves 15 years before the Madison Proclamation was signed. So much for the critical race theory. The other thing that critical race theory, what it really primarily is all about, when you really get down to it, it is to change a person's private worship from God to government. It's about changing our worship from God to government. It's trying to get us to bow down to the altar of the almighty government instead of the almighty God. A good friend of mine, Raphael Cruz, is the father of uh, Ted Cruz. And Raphael told me the story that you know, Raphael, Raphael escaped from Cuba. He said that when he was a young boy in the classroom, had been kindergarten, uh, Fidel Castro would send his soldiers out and go to the classrooms. And he'll go to the kindergarten class and tell the kids, the soldiers will tell the kids, put your head down on your desk and close your eyes and pray to God for some candy. The kids will close their eyes, put their head on the desk, close their eyes. A few minutes will pass. They raise their head up and the soldiers say, where is your candy? Now, think about the impressionable minds of these young children. See, the critical race theory is attacking our children. Then, are, then the uh, Castro soldiers would tell the, these children, put your head down, close your eyes, and, play to, and pray to Fidel for some candy. They would put their head down, close their eyes, and the soldiers would quietly walk around each desk and put some candy on the desk. Raise your head. There's your candy. Trying to change the private worship by starting with our children. That's what this does, the critical race theory. It's trying to change our worship. So what did Douglas say about this? I'm going to paraphrase this because it's on a card. See, again, Douglas is America's greatest liberty messenger. He was a philosopher when it comes to human rights and liberty. Douglas said this in a speech he gave called The, Na the Nature of Slavery. See, you got to understand now, when Douglas wrote, Douglas made it clear that the techniques of oppression used by the slave master are identical to the techniques of oppression used by the slave government. Communism, Marxism. Douglas said this, the first aim of slavery is to remove a person from their God, to separate him or her from their maker. And Doug said, when you separate a person from their maker, they got to rely on despotic, evil fellow citizens to care for them. I didn't say it, Douglas said it. So thank God we have this literary legacy of Douglas. So you get the book, five cards in the back. This is a, you get 20 cards in here, in the book. Now, the books, are, the books are free. The autograph in each book is $20. So you get the whole pack for $20, okay? You get the whole pack for $20, and that's pretty good, because I normally make, sell these for like 30 bucks on the, on the, internet, on the internet. So the, the book with the autograph is already in it, five engagement cards, and 
20 cards, Doug is on the criti Frederick Doug's Republicans on the critical race theory. So if you believe in those life empowering values, you are Frederick Doug's Republicans, not based on color. This is not a black thing, this is a liberty thing. You got that? Make sense to you? I don't want to wear up my welcome, but I'm going to say, let's go ahead and do some Q&A right quick. I'd be happy to answer your question. Yes, sir. I'm glad that I came. Uh, I think that the 19th century may be the greatest age of oratory. Yes. Twenty-six years ago, I became, uh, you know, enthusiast for uh, Frederick Douglass because I found out that, um, besides his message, he was really America's, maybe the world's greatest orator of the 19th century, the yeah. great age of orators. Yeah, I agree. His only his his best competition was Edward Everett, the guy who gave that other speech that nobody remembers at Gettysburg. <laughs> they went, he was the keynote speaker, so. Uh, Sir, can I guess you can the question? I want to be respectful of people's time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. All right, you stand it up. Sir? Yeah, go ahead. What's your question? So, yeah. Um, so, uh, you threw me off. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, uh, something about Douglas, right? Yeah, um, in Vermont, um, Douglas actually comes up lately, in the last few years, when school's out and it's Independence Day, a lot of uh, yeah. public libraries will do the... Fourth of July. It, yeah, it, what to the slaves the Fourth of July? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've seen that, and now I know what to do with that, which is pass out to everybody there information um, on, uh, on Douglas's right. um, values. Right. And, and by the way, I, I think the, the transition I wanted to make was, I'm calling him great orator. You simply use the word liberty messenger. messenger. Um, so what do you think of that? Is there is there a better, can you think of a, a way to do it or a better way to counter, you see, what they're trying to do on July 4th is they're trying to say that Frederick Douglass criticized the Declaration yeah, and the Constitution, yeah. and I want him to be better known for what he really was. Yeah, the, here's how you do that. First of all, you got to read it. Read the whole speech. Yeah. Read the whole speech. Now, in that speech, what, what Douglass did, he did something called a double reversal. He, stopped, he starts off in his speech praising the founders in their effort to fight tyranny in the revolution, okay? He goes on in that speech and he says to them, did y'all bring me here to make mockery of me? Here you are celebrating the 4th of July and four million of your fellow citizens are still in slavery in the South, right? He said, your flag and your anthems are a fraud and a, and a sham, all right? He said, so what to the slaves is your 4th of July and they're, they're in bondage? He said, I need your help to turn this around. He said, clergy, stop going to the pulpit saying that blacks are innately inferior. And politicians, stop passing laws that, that rob blacks of their rights. So he said, I need your help with this. So he says something positive, negative, but he ended some, something positive. When you read Frederick Douglass, you just can't read the 4th of July speech. You got to read Douglass' writings about the Constitution. It's a glorious document. These men were brave men. You, there, there's about five or six quotes that I talk about in the book. Remember, that's one of the values. I give you five things what Douglas said about the Constitution. Now, you gotta, think, you gotta remember now, when Douglas escaped from slavery, his mentor was William Lloyd Garrison. He originally believed that the Constitution was a slavery document because he believed what people told him. But Douglas did something interesting. He read the Constitution for himself, then he read Lysander Spooner's The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, and Doug said, wait a minute. The Constitution is not a pro-slavery document, it's an anti-slavery document. So he had this epiphany. So when you can tell that story and leverage Douglas' writings on the Constitution, 
In addition to that, the left has no answer for it, none, but they cherry pick him. But here's the thing, if you don't know the truth, you can't recognize the lie. That's what's happening. Doug's a bad boy. That brother, that brother's tough. He put Lincoln in check. He put a lot of folks in check. That brother's tough. So thank God we had the writings of Douglas to save this nation and run the Marxists out of here. Because we in a we're we're in a we're in a there is a world championship battle taking place. In one corner you got Karl Marx. In the other corner, you got Frederick Douglass. One's from Germany, a poster child for white privilege. The other young man's from Maryland, born below poverty. Karl Marx, the revolutionist. Frederick Douglass said, in, the, in his uh, third autobiography, Douglass said, I'm not a revolutionist. Douglass said, I'm a reformer. Let's keep the best that we have and make it better. Frederick Douglass. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And so, uh, true. Yeah. Uh, and but the problem I'm facing is that I can't find any training material or curriculum for my school, for my area, about well, what is it? What is going to be taught? And give examples. I really have a problem with that particular area of when I'm out talking with people or just you know whining or whatever you we do naturally. But it's just. Um, where do I go? For I Vermont? Tried, I, well, I tried to yeah, let John take care of that. Yeah. I have some materials right here, actually. Uh -huh. And sorry, I said, so, so these are handouts with some materials, and I do highly recommend Thomas Sowell's works yeah. to, for the broader ed, and this man's book, by the way. Yeah. You can buy it today. <laughs> He'll autograph it twice. But, um, Go look at the curriculum because it varies depending on your individual school. Some have already uh, implemented some of these things, as I've been pointing out. So you really have to look, and you're entitled to. So we have some materials here as well. Federal law entitles parents to have a lot more than just knowing what the curriculum is. All taxpayers should be able to know what the curriculum is, especially when it's experimental on the minds of children and there's no scientific evidence to show that it's not going to be a disaster. Bear in mind, this ain't going away. There, there, are there any media here? Huh, sent a press release to all the media. Geez, it's like, you know, maybe if we just close our ears, the truth will go away. When your children come home and start talking about this stuff, when the parent, you, I assure you, it's there, and they're going to find out, don't you worry. Keep speaking the truth like he does. And I do want to say before, what a gift. Everybody, did we get applause for him? Because I stepped out. So this is, this is me taking credit for spending your money well. Okay? And little, hang on a sec, you're, you're next soon. So many champions here. You folks are awesome. We have leveraged the money that we've raised. You know, we've been doing this since January. Every month we have a meeting, we raise a little money, and then we hire somebody like this who's gonna be a US congressman and we won't be able to afford him anymore. <laughs> I do pray. Because God has a plan. And actually when I heard about him on the uh, campaign trail, I was like, huh, Frederick Douglass Republican, what is this? Because I knew Frederick Douglass. I read his autobiography when I was 12 or 13. I read it again, and at the age of 14 or 15, I was so innate, I actually thought I was Frederick Douglass for a while. It wasn't just you. Yeah. I have a mirror though, see, the mirror didn't enlighten him. What a wonderful story, and, and I'm so excited to, to have you share it. So I want to turn back over to the Q&A, but I want you to buy his books. I want you to get the materials. Everything I do is to equip you. Yeah. Everything he's doing is yeah. to equip you. And in case you didn't catch it, one of the biggest charges I get out of this man's message is he's telling you get off your asses like he's going to, excuse my language, I'm a farmer, I can say stuff, and run for office and work like helping this group. And, and many of you have helped financially and otherwise to have a voice because all we're asking to do is talk. It's not that radical. If you start talking about Frederick Douglass, you have a lot to say. And I will allow you to take some more questions. So please, I'm a farmer. I'm going to milk this guy all I can. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. How do we get the curriculum? 
John, get back yes, up here. So, so again, when you... they won't give it to us. So, so that's very interesting. Can I address that, Sue Paxman, yeah. who's been trying to get the curricula, correct me if I'm wrong, in Barry, and they won't give it to her. They won't answer her questions. Gosh, if it's such a great theory, why can't we drag it out in the light and let it die like the vampire it is? Why won't you let us see? So they're actually, that's called whack-a-mole, right. remember? They've already done it. Let me tell you what, they're terrified, and they're nowhere more terrified for good reason than in Vermont where they've already implemented it, or are you doing it to children? And they're hurting children already. So keep asking, Sue. It, you just keep asking. How do you get it? I guess, you know, eventually we could file a lawsuit, but what I'm saying is how do you get it? The parents, this is what they don't want you to do. The parents control content and curricula in this state. The state is not setting this curricula. It's being done in your school boards. The fact that they're ramming it down people's throats and putting BLM on their flags up only will help us when the payback comes, when the pushback comes, when people start realizing as parents what's happening. So that's when we'll find out, and then we'll get it out. And by the way, a guy named Ben Morley is doing some work up in the kingdom, and a lot of people are coming forward. We're still dragging this stuff out in the light. So sorry, that's a Vermont-specific question. John, how come it, how, we can't get a movement going where we just vote down every, every budget every year until they pull it out? Aren't we? I do. So, so who is in a movement right now? I told you, this is a coup against the United States Constitution. This is anti-constitutional. It's all over. It's not just critical race theory. So yes, we have to, we have to vote. It's called democracy or a republic. But we, we have to go and take back our school boards. And we're going to because the parents do. We, the people of whatever color, do control our school boards. Isn't that right? Yeah. Say amen. Amen. But I, look, I think it's time to boycott. It's time to walk out of these schools. Um, I took my son out of the school system. I'm not, I'm not trying to engage in no 50-year fight. I'm pulling them out. And matter of fact, one thing we're doing, because of the Opportunity Zone, my brothers and I, we bought uh, 100 and, 110 acres of land in Birmingham area. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to start a Frederick, Douglass, a Frederick Douglass STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Academy. <coughs> and it won't be a charter school because I don't want somebody to come tell me who I can send and can't send to the restroom. I'm not doing that. It'll be, a, it'll be a Christian academy. And it will feature the Frederick Douglass Liberty Curriculum. And what that is, well, we're going to inspire the next generation of Frederick Douglass Liberty Ambassadors to counter what? Marxism. We've got to start with the young people. I want to say this too. When you engage people, a lot of folks don't understand communism. They don't understand socialism. They think it's great. They don't know it because they don't have the experience of people living in third world countries. They don't understand totalitarianism. So what I've learned when I talk to people, especially young people, even some adults, I have to use a different metaphor with them. I can't talk about those isms. They don't understand that. I, so I talk about a slavery. I, talk, I give them a slavery metaphor. So when I talk about slavery, then I bring in something Douglas said about his life that correlates to what we're dealing with. Because the techniques of oppression used by the slave master are identical <coughs> excuse me, to the techniques of oppression used by the slave government. It's in there. It's the same thing. I call it the parallels of oppression. Some water. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know our three, you know our three uh, stooges? Yeah. Who's your three stooges? They are the three stooges. Are you senators? Here, here in Vermont? <laughs> 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 they, they, they not only believe in redistribution of wealth, they're redistribution, there's redistribution of people. So when I go into Costco's or Walmart, I feel like I'm in a foreign country. And I don't understand all the languages. What do you think of that policy? What did that I'm not familiar with that. What they do what now? I'm not following you on that one. They're resettling, they're resettling refugees in Vermont. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, yeah like filling them out. So I don't know where the jobs are. At well, that's, that's the problem. There's not enough economic... Well, yeah. You know, my thing about when I came to Vermont, it's talking about the critical race theory. If you're a racist, do you have enough blacks in Vermont to, to practice your racism? <laughs> <laughs> Where are they? You know, no, no, that's a joke, by the way, okay? So it ain't good one. I asked a friend who is brown, I said, are you, and he had just moved here, 
are you finding that Vermont is racist? And this was a couple of years ago. And he said, no, but they're creating it. Yes, they have to. They have to. Commitment now, you got to get Manny Johnson's book. See, the left has also has no answer for Manny Johnson. Cause Manny was one of them. Manny was a liberal. He was a communist. He talks about what they're doing. And they create, they have to create racial tension even though it doesn't exist because that's how you're going to destroy America from the inside, through racial strife. Ignore the past accomplishments. Ignore that. But when, when, when racial relationships gets better and it's improving, they got to bring it in, something in to tear it down. That's what they do. Manny talked about that. I didn't say Manny talked about it. Yes, sir. You started about 12 years ago. That's just about the time uh, Barack Obama got elected president. Yes, sir. What is your opinion of what he tried to accomplish? What was my opinion? What he tried to accomplish? Well, I mean, I, I've seen stuff where. <laughs> what did he do? Much of what you did was you counted off uh, of the 45. Yeah, 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 yeah. You picked about 10 different items, and I've seen stuff like that that he followed the, some of those items pretty closely. Also. Well, look. I did my homework before I voted. I did not vote for him either time. I knew he's the first black person to occupy the highest office in the land. I understand that. My, my grandchildren understood he's the first person of color. But I need some political substance, not political sub celebrityism. Uh, what kind of policies are you passing that's in line with the values of Frederick Douglass? I didn't see it. When he shut down the, the uh, school choice program in DC, when he shut that down, where now these, these kids, he defunded it, these black kids now, who were in poor schools, didn't have the opportunity no longer to go to better schools, had a problem with that. He cut the funding to historical black colleges when he was, when he was president. And I know because I was involved with one of the HBCU presidents lobbying for that. So it was sad because, to me, but he was just of the wrong school of thought. He's not. That's not a Frederick Douglass school of thought, no. But I, but I do recognize his accomplishment in that seat, but in terms of political substance, it wasn't there for me. Yes, sir. Mr. Smith, uh, you and I share two things in common. I'm a Christian and you are too. Yes, sir. And I have black children. Yes, sir. And there's something that just I cannot get over, and I just keep looking for the answer. Okay. Yeah. The churches are divided. We got black churches and we've got white churches. Now in Vermont, there's like one black church somewhere in Vermont. But what do we do about that? I don't think we should. Did Frederick Douglass address that? How do we explain that phenomenon? His, his comment was the most segregated, the most segregated day of the week is Sunday. That's what he's saying. Is that a problem? I don't necessarily see that as a problem because we got different styles of worship. So I don't see that as a problem. But the concern is, what are we doing the other days of the week? Are we taking our worship and are we using, are we, are we, are we forgetting about our biblical teachings on Sunday on the other days of the week? Now, let me put it this way. When you read my book, I give you my testimony when I was a Democrat. And what changed my thinking was, was 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, where it says, examine yourself, make sure you're solid in the faith, don't go along taking things for granted. I started examining the way I was worshiped, the way I was voting. My worship was different from how I was voting. I don't believe in same-sex marriage. I don't believe in homosexuality. I don't believe in abortion. But I was voting that way. See what I'm saying? That's the problem. I was not voting the way of my worship. And in the book, I talk about where God pierced my spirit and diagnosed me as a political schizophrenic. I was really spitting in God's face based on how I was voting. I wasn't voting my values. So that's just a personal thing. And I actually went through three days of depression when that happened. Because all the things I believed to be true, I found it was a lie. When that happens, and I was depressed for three days, didn't come out the house. And that's when I realized my values are more aligned. Now, see, now the Republican Party is bad, the Democrat Party is worse. Okay, there's no perfect party. So you got to be involved where God plants you and be a, a, be a light in darkness wherever you go. But 
you got to go based on your values. We don't need everybody to become Republicans. We everybody to vote their values if they know what their values are. And then we can, t we can save this nation. Yeah. For me, when people ask me why I'm no longer a Democrat, because for me, I didn't want to be part. Once I started reading Frederick Douglass understanding history more, I did not want to be part of any organization or political party that could put my great-great-grandparents in slavery. I'm not going to be part of that. But at the same time, I'm going to make sure that the Republican Party adhere to its platform. And if not going to, they don't do it, they're going to be agitated out. Yes? I have kind of a two-part question. OK. Uh, first, can I be a Frederick Douglass independent? OK. And second, <laughs> second uh, Mr. Clark here introduced you last night as a man of color. Do you consider yourself a man of color? Yeah, I am. I'm, well, not, I'm not the invisible man. I see, uh, <laughs> I see something a little bit different. Oh, you know, okay. When you, John Clark, gets up there and you're up there, I see you both as men of color, red, white, and blue. I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. The first question, Frederick Doug is independent. I'm giving it to you the way God gave it to me. Don't say Frederick Doug is libertarian. Don't say Frederick Doug is patriot. There's a reason why I think God gave me Frederick Doug is Republican because it's a clear oxymoron. And, it, and when people hear it, and what happened in the barbershop, my brother, I said, what happened? He said, he told, he said when, he Fred, when he said Frederick Doug is Republican, they said, wait a minute, what does Doug have to do with the Republican Party? So they gave him a chance to explain how Douglas was one of the reasons why the Republican Party was started. He was the voice piece of the abolitionist movement. And they started talking about the history of the Republican Party, the pro-black history of the Republican Party, Douglas' involvement in that. So it helps to, when you say Frederick Douglass Republican, now you can get into the writings of Douglas as it relates to the party. See, there's only one dog in the fight. It's the conservatives against the Marxists, and it's the Republican Party against the Democrats. It ain't the independents. I'm just sorry to tell you. Okay, it's one dog in the fight, and we got to get that dog ready to fight. I'm now I'm, I'm, I am I'm anti-establishment Republican Party. Okay, I'm anti-establishment. That's part of the problem, because the established Republican Party oftentimes um, cooperate with the elitists in the Democrat Party. I can tell you some personal experiences about that. Here in Vermont, we can tell you some. I bet you can. <laughs> Again, I don't want to overstay my welcome, uh, but I want to thank you for coming and thank you for your questions. I hope this made uh, sense to you because Frederick Doug is so comprehensive. And again, thank God that we have this literary legacy of Douglas that we can leverage if we choose to. Um, and the other thing is, I don't know if President Trump is coming back. If he comes back or not, we still got to do our job. And that's getting in the trenches and engaging in encouraging people to understand through leveraging Frederick Douglass the importance of liberty, the importance of the, the importance of the Constitution. And we can do that when you leverage Douglas. If you can change how your parents think, you can engage anybody. And I was able to do it with my, with my family members. My parents, when they were alive, they would not describe themselves as conservative. In lieu of saying that, they described themselves as a Frederick Douglass Republican. See? Remember, it's not a black thing, it's not a color thing, it's a liberty thing, it's about values. Thank you so much. I have some autographs in the back for you. Wonderful. The host is fan. Please stay and, and, and buy books. And we hope to hold some more events like this as we do look forward to on cool. these principles. Thank you very much for coming.